It was the birthday of the Infanta. She was just twelve years of age and the sun was shining brightly in the gardens of the palace. Although she was a real princess and the Infanta of Spain, she had only one birthday every year, just like the children of quite poor people. So it was a naturally a matter of great importance to the whole country that she should have a really fine day for the occasion. And a really fine day it certainly was. The tall stripped tulips stood straight up upon their stalks like long rows of soldiers and looked defiantly across the grass at the roses and said, We are quite as splendid as you are now. The purple butterflies fluttered about with gold dust on their wings, visiting each flower in turn. The little lizards crept out of the crevices of the wall and lay basking in the white glare, and the pomegranate split and cracked with the heat and showed their bleeding red hearts. Even the pale yellow lemons that hung in such profusion from the mouldering trellis and along the dim arcades seemed to have caught a richer colour from the wonderful sunlight, and the magnolia trees opened their great globe like blossoms of folded ivory and filled the air with a sweet, heavy perfume. The little princess herself walked up and down the terrace with her companions and played at hide and seek round the stone vases and the old moss-grown statues. On ordinary days she was only allowed to play with the children of her own rank, so she had always to play alone. But her birthday was an exception. There was a stately grace about these slim Spanish children as they glided about, the boys with their large plumbed hats and short fluttering cloaks, the girls holding up the trains of their long brocaded gowns and shielding the sun from their eyes with huge fans of black and silver. But the Infanta was the most graceful of all and the most beautifully attired. After the somewhat cumbersome fashion of the day, her robe was of grey satin, the skirt and the wide puffed sleeves heavily embroidered with silver, and the stiff corset studded with rows of fine pearls. Two tiny slippers with big pink rosettes peeped out beneath her dress as she walked. Pink and pearl was her great gaze fan, and in her hair, which like an aureole of faded gold stood out stiffly round her pale little face, she had a beautiful white rose. From a window in the palace, the sad, melancholy king watched him. Behind him stood his brother. Don Pedro of Aragon, whom he hated, and his confessor, the Grand Inquisitor of Granada, sat by his side. Sadder even than usual was the king, for as he looked at the Infanta bowing with childish gravity to the assembling counters, or laughing behind her fan at the grim Duchess of Albuquerque, who always accompanied her, he thought of the young queen, her mother who but a short time before, so it seemed to him, had come from the gay country of France and had withered away in the sombre splendour of the Spanish court, dying just six months after the birth of her child, and before she had seen the almonds blossom twice in the orchard, or plucked the second year's fruit from the old Ganar fig tree that stood in the centre of the now grass-grown courtyard. So great had been his love for her, that he had not suffered even the grave to hide her from him. She had been embalmed by a Moorish physician, who in return for his service had been granted his life, which, for heresy and suspicion of magical practices, had been already forfeited. Men said, 
to the holy office, and her body was still living on its tapestried bier in the black marble chapel of the palace, just as the monks had borne her in on that windy March day nearly twelve years before. Once every month the king, wrapped in a dark cloak and with a muffled lantern in his hand, when the knelt by her side calling out, My Rana, my Rana. And sometimes, breaking through the formal etiquette that in Spain governs every separate action of life, and sets limits even to the sorrow of a king. He would clutch at the pale, jewel hands in a wild agony of grief and try to wake by his mad kisses the cold, painted face. 